travel to Marage to learn the newest theories and discoveries of astronomy. I would have referred to the works of Persian mathematician Khwarazmi, whose name is synonymous with algebra. At the same time, we would have lamented the fact that in recent years, some museums and libraries around the world, apparently seduced by the flow of pe Arab petrodollars, have begun to call their Persian collections by the misnomer of Islamic, or sometimes even Arabic art and culture. We would have referred to the work of scholars who have found strong Persian influences on such canonical works of Western consciousness as Dante's Divine Comedy and the works of Chaucer. We would have together traced the early evolution of the Paris University, the center of intellectual ferment and rebirth in 13th century Europe, and we could have shown the role Persian thinkers and scientists played in this renaissance of rationality. I could have described what I think was a native Persian modernity that emerged between the 10th and 12th centuries in Iran. We could have talked of Behaqi and Saadi, of Nizamiya Aruzi and Razi, who long before the West began to experiment with ideas that would later form the kernel of the Renaissance. I would invite you to read Ohran Pamuk's new novel, My Name is Red, where the Turkish author suggests that Persian painters of the Qazvin and Harat schools experimented with the laws of perspective long before Giotto painted what is hailed as the first modern painting. I could have described some of the wonders of the 16th century city of Esfahan and how it captured the imagination of so many European travelers awed by its grand mosques, its sumptuous bazaars, its three-lined boulevards, its splendid gardens. Versailles in France is said to have been at least partially inspired by these gardens. Much, in fact, could have been said about the idea of a Persian garden, so different from its Western counterpart. As Persian gardens found their way to the West, so did the Persian word Pardis where it became the source of the word paradise. <clears throat> if we had time, we could have talked of the unusual number of invariably favorable references to Persia in Shakespeare's poems and plays. You might have been surprised to learn that Shakespeare was familiar with the writings of the Shirley brothers and other English travelers to Safavi Iran. It was probably the reports of these uh, brothers that led Shakespeare to equate Persia the land of the Sophie, with the luxury and lavishness and beauty. To complete our overture, we would have had to talk about the formative role Persians plays in the development of Sufism. We would have talked about the influence these Sufi poets had in the development of the 19th century romantics. We would have together browsed through some of the essays of Emerson, the quintessential American intellectual, and read the passages where he suggests with no hint of hyperbole, that Saadi should be talked about uh, uh, as one of the, uh, uh, Saadi, I missed the line here, uh, is only comparable to the Bible in terms of the universality of his transcendental wisdom. We could have talked about Goethe, one of the greatest German romantic poets of all time, who in his own words reached a new mountain peak in his life when he first encountered the poetry of Hafiz. He went on to write his Eastern Divan as a homage to Persian poets. We would have reminisced about Khayyam, his genius for science and poetry, as well as his contagious appetite for a loaf of bread and a jug of wine. We might have found in his poetry early traces of what in the 20th century has come to be called existentialism. We would have talked of the 19th century, 11th century poet Rumi, who is today the best-selling poet of America. We could have talked of the impressive